Until recently, the Catholic Church in Ireland went largely unquestioned as the Republic's highest moral authority, and its teachings on sexual behaviour were simple and strict. Sex outside marriage was not only objectionable, but like murder, a mortal sin. And women who fell under suspicion were condemned by both community and church as fallen women. In Ireland, especially in them days, the church ruled the roost. The church was always right. You never criticised the priest, you never criticised them holy nuns. You did what they said without christening the reason why. To think about your body was a sin, it wasn't right. It made me very angry to think these were the people who were God's vicars on earth and they set an example to us. We were supposed to follow in their footsteps and they were so cruel. They were really cruel to us. And let's face it, we never done anything wrong. Priests in the Catholic Church take a vow of celibacy. As the brides of Christ, nuns live lives of holy self-denial. And in Ireland, in a time before sex education or contraception, it fell to the Church to teach young women that chastity in thought and deed was the only protection from the sin of sex. For those girls and young women being brought up in the care of the Church, not only was the message particularly powerful, this power could be cruelly abused. This is the story of four such women. Bridget Young grew up in a Catholic orphanage in Limerick. When we start to, started to develop, um, we were told quite clear from the nuns that there was no way that we could show breasts, even through our clothes, we couldn't show breasts. We had to make ourselves as flat as pancakes. Phyllis Valentine grew up in an orphanage in County Clare in the 1940s. When you started developing, they put like a sort of a bodice, it was calico, just two straps on it, and it was tight and real tight round you. It was very uncomfortable, I know. The nuns told you, if a girl was nice looking, or she had nice hair, the hair was cut, you know? And then, when you started developing, and, well, girls, you know how they look down at their bodies when they're young, the nun would notice, or one of the monitors would notice and tell, You'd be brought into the big office and you'd be sat down and told that it was a sin to be vain, it was a sin to go around swinging your hair, it was a sin to be looking at your body. You were told that by the nuns. They used to touch you a lot. They used to line us up every Saturday night and they used to make us strip naked for them and they would be standing at the bottom of the laundry and they would be laughing at us and they would be criticising us and if you were heavy, fat or whatever um, shout abuse to us, you know we had no privacy with them at all no privacy they enjoyed us strip naked
The unchallenged influence of the church over all girls and women meant that most approached courtship in a state of ignorance. Contraception was illegal and there was no sex education. But religious dogma alone failed to prevent many thousands of single young women from becoming pregnant. Christina Mulcahy went out with a soldier in 1940. I didn't know much anything about the facts of life and I didn't know that I would uh, conceive her. So I stayed with him and he said he loved me. And I thought to myself, well, if he loves me that much, why would he persuade me to um, do this, have sex with him? And he said that this was the only um, true way to show that you love somebody. And... I met him again then. He said, well, you did it before, why can't you do it now? And that was the time I got pregnant. Frequently rejected by their families and with no one by nuns, such places were regarded as charitable, but in reality, they treated the mothers as fallen women in need of punishment. In 1940, Christina had a baby boy and was still hoping to marry his father. I was writing from the home, I was writing letters to him, but he came to see me when the baby first born and, and uh, with, but the nuns had sat at the other end within ear, ear of what we were saying. <coughs> and he said that I could put his name down for the baby's name. And, um, and I discussed that with, with the matron. But then, then he he was gone, and he was he was he wasn't getting the letters that I was writing out. They weren't sending them to him at all. He never got the letters that I wrote out, and I never got any letters from him. So I lost out on him. I I would have married him. I loved him. Nuns arranged for illegitimate babies to be placed in their orphanages, often to be fostered or adopted. To the mothers, it seemed that they had no choice but to give their babies away. Nothing could prepare the unmarried mother for the sudden loss of a baby that she had loved and nurtured, sometimes for almost a year. He was only 10 months old when she said to me one day, as soon as you're finished in the nursery, come to my office and um, you're going home today. And I was bre breastfeeding the baby at the time. And she I said, can I go back? And said goodbye to the baby. What does he know about anything? Go back and upset him. I said, you're not going back, there's a car waiting. And I said, no, no time to say goodbye. No time to say goodbye. In the village communities of rural Ireland, the stigma of bearing an illegitimate baby was so great that many mothers were rejected by their families. After being separated from her son, Christina was driven back to her village of Carrigan in County Galway. My father came to the gate and two little brothers and little sister. And uh, they stopped and he said to me, what do you think you want? I said, I want to come home. You're not coming to this house. You're not coming to this house. You've disgraced us. You're right, right in the head. You can't be right in your head to bring a child into this world. And you deserve punishment. The punishment was to be sent to one of Ireland's ten Magdalen asylums. These institutions, run by orders of nuns like the Good Shepherds, 
had been built in the 19th century outside Dublin, Limerick and other Irish cities. Named after Mary Magdalene, the prostitute who repented and was forgiven by Jesus, the original purpose of the Magdalene Asylums was to chastise and correct the fallen woman who had sold her body for sex. But by the 1940s, the majority of the inmates were unmarried mothers. Some girls, however, were sent there simply because of a suspicion that their chastity had been violated. Martha Cooney grew up on a farm in County Roscommon. When I was 14, I was sent to a cousin to help on the farm. And he took me uh, to um, a farm fair. And he had a lot to drink. And on the way home, he indecently assaulted me. And I told a cousin what happened. And the cousin reported the matter. And they got rid of me very quickly. biggest sin in Ireland, well apart from having a baby in them days without being married, was to talk. You never let the neighbours know. And to get rid of you. There's no talk. There's no scandal. And they weren't sure. So that was the safest bet. A way to Dublin, you see. In 1941, aged 14, Martha was taken to one of Ireland's main Magdalene asylums, which provided secure accommodation for hundreds of women. The girls who made the journey to these institutions had no idea of the fate that awaited them. Phyllis Valentine grew up in an orphanage in County Clare. At 15, she was told the church had found her work in a laundry. I went with the nuns and the priest, and we went to Galway. And I shall never forget the day as long as I live. These big, big gates opened. All you could see was these bars on the windows, big high walls. And I went in through this gravel path. And two or three nuns came out, and a priest came out. Well, he was a bishop, I think. He had a red robe on. And he came out to meet me. And I was brought in this long, long corridor. Still distraught after the separation from her baby son, Christina Mulcahy was sent by her family to a Magdalene asylum in Galway, run by the Sisters of Mercy. I felt like, I think I'd gone gone crazy. I was full of breast milk. I didn't know. I didn't know how I would explain to the nuns how I felt. And I could feel a fever in or in me. And I was, I was sick. I think I went to the, their sick bay for about a week. And when I, when I came over there, my clothes were confiscated and I was put into this brown, old brown, coarse material. They took away my clothes and they gave, gave me this horrible... Ugly drab, I suppose, it was uniform. They were shapeless and they were meant to make you as ugly as, as possibly could. She told me I'd have to have my hair cut because my hair was long. And she said they didn't allow long hair, that my hair would have to be cut. But I had it nicely tied up in a ponytail and I wanted my hair long. And I think I started crying, like... But my hair was cut. It was cut right up to above my ears. (laughs) 
Just as Mary Magdalene, the repentant prostitute, had to reject her sexuality for her soul to be saved, so too did the girls who entered the Magdalene Asylum. They were called penitents, and with their hair cropped and wearing drab uniforms little changed since Victorian times, their penance was to work in Magdalene laundries for no pay. The labour was symbolic, the purging of sin by the washing of dirty linen. We worked all the time, and the work was very hard because we had to bend over the big sinks, washing, scrubbing, you know, collars, cuffs. And we also ironed very, very heavy starched altar linen and surplices that the priest wore. And I got varicose veins from the ironing at 15. And I was told that that was a very privileged job to do. I did ask to be paid the first week that I worked there. They just laughed at me. They really did laugh. I, I felt degraded. And that's when the sister turned round and told me that I was here and I would stay here until somebody came to fetch me. I thought maybe we'd do six months there and then be let out and, and that I would be allowed to go and see my baby. <sighs> and when I went first place, they put me, they put me into the laundry. <sighs> so I used to keep saying, when do you think I'll be going home? But when will I be going out? And um, one day, one girl said to me, once you come here, you won't be going out. The Magdalene Asylums were cut off from the outside world, run by orders of nuns, their lives dedicated to the service and worship of God. Some of the penitents were not told why they'd been sent to work in the laundries. Phyllis Valentine only discovered the truth after several years' incarceration. When I was young, I was thought to be pretty. Well, some of the girls thought I was quite pretty. I had quite nice hair. And I did ask Sister once why I was sent from the orphanage straight to the Magdalene Laundry. And this sister said to me, you're as pretty as a picture. And I hadn't heard what she said first, and I asked her to repeat it. And she repeated, you're as pretty as a picture, she said. And she said, the nuns sent you here because they were afraid you'd fall away. Falling away meant you'd get pregnant and that would be another mouth for them to feed. So it was best for you to go to the Magdalene Laundry, stay there, which was dominated by nuns and priests, and they knew then that you wouldn't get into any trouble. So I was put to the Magdalene Laundry for that reason only. The regime in the laundries was relentless. The Magdalene penitents worked six days a week, 52 weeks a year, from early in the morning until late at night. We were caged. And we were powerless to do anything about it. About it. We had no recreation, anything just work and prayer and silence and atoning for the sins and how wicked you were and they reckon the told us very often that Mary Magdalene was forgiven so we should we would be forgiven in time.
We used to have to bow to the nuns every time that we saw them. And if a nun was coming towards you, you had to stand still like to let her pass as a mark of respect. When you committed a small misdemeanor, you had to kneel down in front of the nun and you had to say, I am so sorry, Mother. Please forgive me. I won't do it again. And she graciously forgave you. You see, the nuns, they were gods to you. You didn't dare question them. What they had done was right, and you followed their instructions to the letter. You didn't dare. It was as simple as that. You just done what you were told. We were told that um, special friendships wasn't allowed in there. And the only thing that made you happy was the love of God. And to be detached from all things and people was a truly spiritual way. In order to encourage them to forget their sinful past, the women were made to work in silence. But after six months in the Magdalene Asylum, Christina Mulcahy had not yet given up hope of being reunited with her son and was desperate for news of him. A young girl came, came in and uh, we're not as supposed to like to ask any questions of anybody where they came from or were they from the street or what area they came from or anything. Let them come in and not even be friendly with them, you know. This girl was sent to the section I was in. I said, did you come from the baby home? The mother and baby home? And she said yes. And uh, I asked, did she know about my little boy? And she said, uh, oh, he was OK, and she knew him, and that he would soon be boarded out. And I went berserk, nearly went mad, and they wondered why I was crying. And um, she said to me one day, this nun said to me one day, oh, why, why was I upset? And I said, I think it's coming to the time that my little baby will be. <sighs> Either sent to a foster home or to uh, one of these institutions where little boys are sent and they don't get pre treated well, you know. And uh, I couldn't, I couldn't p pass my views on, but I said when he was a baby that I didn't want him adopted, ever. And the women there were absolutely desperate to find out where their children were, absolutely desperate. And when they did say that the children was adopted, it was very sad. It was really very sad. Because all the girl could do was cry. That's all she could do. There was nothing else she could do, cry. The lot did have tantrums. They'd smash things up, smash windows, kick the machines, things like that. Some of the girls did get punished. And they used to get pushed about quite a bit, punched slapped. The nuns had this black leather belt that was tied round their waist and hung quite to the ground and they used to wrap it up in their hand and really hit you hard with it. They were very vicious, some of the nuns. Very, very vicious. The regime worked to break the remaining bond between the mother and the separated child. However, Christina was not a willing penitent. I, I, I stopped working. I, I, I stopped. I went and sat down. I sat, in the, I sat in the recreation room and wouldn't come out of the recreation room. They asked me to leave the recreation room. I went and sat on the stairs. They locked the recreation room door and I sat on the stairs. 
and it was then that the sister came up and she had this um, belt around her and the end of the belt it was a long like a strap and she was waving the strap you know she was waving this thing about to get off the stairs and go to work I said you promised me that I go out to see my child you promised me I'll go to work. You promise me I go to see my child. That's all I am asking. I'm a sensible person. I am not daft or crazy or criminal. All I want is to see my child. And she was waving this thing. I said, now, and she was coming closer to me, you lift your hand and hit me, I will kill you. I mean what I'm saying. And I felt that surge. I felt I I would kill her. I re- I tell you, I would have never seen my child because I'd have been put to prison. I, I wouldn't end up... Uh, they may have kept me there, but that's all I wanted, to see my child. Limerick's Magdalen Asylum had an orphanage attached. Some of the children were those of the penitents, but they were kept in strict isolation from their mothers. Bridget Young grew up there in the 1940s. We were not allowed to talk to the Magdalens. We weren't allowed to look at them. Um, no contact with them whatsoever because we were made to believe that they were very, very bad children. There were people who were devils, they were sinners. Any contact between the Magdalens and the orphans was forbidden. Whenever the beds were changed down in the orphanage. We took all the heavy linen up to the Magdalens, to the laundry, but the back gate was always locked. And when they would hear the trolley coming, one of them would actually come out and take the linen in. Well, this particular day, there was two of us, and we wheeled up the linen as usual, and there was a Magdalene standing at the back gate when we got there. She said to me, do you have a child down there by the name of Margaret Moore? And I said, yes, we do. She said, that's my child, and I don't know what she looks like, but I haven't seen her since she was a year old. So she was trying to make arrangements with me to bring this child up on top of the flat roof over the infirmary. And she would come out at the back gate if I would bring the child to the railings. And I agreed I would. But I got caught that same day. One of the nuns was coming out of the chapel She started clapping her hands and, you know, running and just flew over to the back gate of the Magdalene Laundry, just grabbed two of us by the ears, run us right down the hill, brought us into the Reverend Mother, and uh, the Reverend Mother took it from there. She asked us to wait in the back a shed and she would be in to deal with us you know after that so we went into the back shed and she came in with a great big long rubber black rubber it wasn't a belt but it was something that 
she had specially made for the children to beat the children with. And um, a scissors and an open razor. And she shaved both our heads and gave us a severe beat. And after she did that, she grabbed the two of us again and she made us look in the mirror to see what we had looked like after she had finished with us. And that's what happened. And I'll never forget what looked back at me. Totally devastating. Your forehead all swelled up. Under my chin all bleeding where she had stuck the scissors wide open. Um, the blood running into my eyes. My eyes totally closed. And she was making us open them eyes and look in that mirror. And you're not so pretty now, are you? I'll never forget that day. And this was just because talking to Magdalene's. I was getting too friendly with the Magdalene's. Priests made regular visits to the Magdalene asylums to conduct mass and take confession. Christina Mulcahy, having defied a nun's authority, had to seek further absolution for her sins. You're in a screen, you're inside a box, in a screen, and uh, when I said that I had something more to say, like that I wanted to sit, well, come round, come, come this side and, and sit here and, and tell me about it. And he was all exposed. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe. Well, I, I thought it'd be my word against him. You see, if I go and sell, Sister Paul would be the only one I could go to. And I, I, I told her. And I was told to be quiet and not keep my mouth shut. I said, Sister Paul, why do, why are you saying things like this to me? You think that I'm crazy in my head that I didn't see this thing? He denied it straight away. I said, you're not a man of God. You really are not. And I said, I didn't want any more. And I, and I said, I wouldn't go to confession or, or go to church anymore. So I sat, I sat on the stairs and on a Sunday and wouldn't go. So the next thing was, they cut all my hair off. The punishment for Mary Magdalene was the model for the retribution meted out to the penitents. But having been accused of sexual impropriety, they were targets for abuse from their supposed moral tutors. Whenever you broke a rule like that, they always brought you to a priest to bless you. I was sitting in the parlour with him, and he, he was on one chair and I was at the other. And he talked away to me for a while. And then he started to move his seat towards me and wrap his two legs round my legs. And then he wrapped up his penis in a white handkerchief And then he was getting himself all worked up on top of me. And then at the end, he just came over and just masturbated all over my dress. And I just said to him, what's that? I didn't know what that was. I mean, I had been in that convent for all them years. I never knew what sex was. Um, I've had no experience of males or females or whatever. And I was very confused of what was going on. 
and then he continued after that. He done it another three times after that, at the back of the main gate, before he said mass in the morning. If um, I had tried to talk about that to any of the nuns, I would have been a Magdalene. That's not something you would have spoke to the nuns about or any other child there. You just didn't talk and that was it. I was too frightened to talk because I didn't know what I was talking about anyway. I mean, I didn't... Although I knew what, was, what he'd done, but could I explain that in my own words? No, I couldn't explain that. I knew something wasn't right about the whole thing. And yet, oh, the nuns were the last people you could talk to. You couldn't do that. There seemed to be no escape from the Magdalen asylums and the orphanages attached to them. The penitents were virtual prisoners, unaware of their rights and without any sign of when or how they could leave. Many believed that their fate was to work in the laundries forever, and some remained there all their life. The nuns would say, oh, you've, your life isn't worth living now, you've, you've fell from grace and you fell for your respectability is gone and and you better make your mind up to stay here for your life and I would say I I've I've got a baby and I'm going to go out. I'm going to get out of here and I don't care how I get out of here, but I'm going out of here. I will not stay in this place forever. Few did escape, but the walls were that high, you'd be cut to ribbons. There was like barbed wire. There was also iron spikes sticking out of the walls. You, it had to be planned. You couldn't just at the spur of the moment say, I'm going and go. There was one way the girls did escape. When the cattle were being brought in and driven by the old lady, they would sly out the side entrance as she was locking up the main gate. Maggie was letting the cows in, and as she went on ahead, uh, I slipped out the other side, she went that side of the cows, and I slipped out that side, and I went into the street and got away and went straight to my friend's house. And just as I was on top of the street going into my friend's house, the bell started ringing. The nuns didn't like it when anyone escaped and then all hell would break loose and all the bells would go off and then we'd be all delighted because we knew somebody had got out once them bells started ringing. The nuns would be scurrying round, really scurrying from one place to the other. I said, let me come in quickly, let me come in quickly, the police will be here in a minute. Where were you, where were you, what is it, what is it? Were you in prison? I said, no, 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 I was in that madhouse up the road. So she said... Oh, come in, come in, come in. She said, what's it all? What's it all about? What's it all about? And I said, I had a baby, and they put me in there. My parents, father and mother put me in there. All I could think about was my child, and I found out that he was uh, fostered out. But I, I couldn't stay around because I was afraid that, that, that if they caught up with me, I'd go back again. And if my parents found out where I was, they would uh, send for me. Christina made her way to Northern Ireland to work as a nurse. She had spent three years in the Magdalen Asylum before her escape. Some of the penitents' defiance of the nuns hardened as they grew up. I started to rebel, I thought, I'm 21, 22 years of age, I'm going to be here forever more, you know, I want out. So I wouldn't do my work. They used to lock the dormitories. So while the girl had gone down the clock, I lay under the bed so she didn't spot me. 
and when the door was locked, I lay on top of my bed. I miss mass, I miss my dinner, I miss my breakfast, I miss my tea. And I'd let my hair grow, and it was way down my back. It was really nice, thick, shiny black hair. And the sister come along, get that hair cut, she said. This lady's going to cut it for you, and she had the lady beside her with a shears to cut my hair. So I really kicked up a stink. I punched the door. I did lose my temper, but I was determined she wasn't going to cut my hair. And I won. She didn't cut my hair. She left me alone. In 1964, after eight years' incarceration at the Sisters of Mercy Asylum in Galway, Phyllis was released. Some of the penitents were eventually tracked down by sympathetic relatives. In 1945, after spending four years in a Magdalene asylum, Martha Cooney was rescued by her cousin, Jim. On the day of my release, it was a wonderful, exhilarating feeling, I suppose you'd call it. And in the afternoon, Jim came for me and took me out, and I was free. Adapting to life outside, though, was an awesome challenge. I was wondering if I'd be able to make it on my own. And you see, not having seen many people, only the, the usual, not having seen people dressed up, I mean, the clothes and every, everything, everything was different. The spaces and the come and go as you please and whatever. It was wonderful. When I left the Magdalene Laundry, I went to Dublin, and I felt very self-conscious. I thought people knew who I was and what I'd done. I was supposed to be a real bad person in this Magdalene Laundry, and I was frightened to talk to anyone. I was forever looking over my shoulder. And if somebody looked at you in the street, you yourself felt that they were looking at you because you were bad. They didn't know who you were, they didn't know anything about you, but this was how you felt inside. In 1956, Bridget Young left the orphanage in Limerick. She had avoided the experience of the laundry, but the emotional scars of torture and sexual abuse still affected her ten years later when she married. It did have an effect, a terrible effect, because then, if it had never had a good man, whatever, you can't really... fall into that marriage and feel that you're happy with that marriage because at the back of your mind you don't want to know you know it's something that I think because of the way it was done I just didn't want to know anything about it you know sex life it doesn't last. You just don't want it. It haunts you. All I wanted to do was do a job and be independent. But I have never wanted to marry or make a commitment to anybody. Because I never wanted anybody to have power over me or chain me ever again. I met my husband when I was 25. He was quite a nice man. We got on very well. But I didn't like the sexual part of the marriage. I didn't like it at all. I felt it was wrong. 
He was very patient for a long, long time. He was very, very patient. And that, but eventually, we broke up. I felt ashamed. Every time he touched me, I thought it was wrong. The nuns had told us it was wrong to let a man touch you. They never prepared us for the outside world. I was really wrong of them, you know. But I wanted to have children. And I did have children from my husband, beautiful children. Christina Mulcahy also married and had children. But she was haunted by the memory of her first baby boy, whom she kept secret for over 50 years. I lost shame and respect and pride and everything that went with it. Anybody, any girl that has a baby out of wedlock is, is, is a fallen person and they have no luck. They, they fall, they, they lose their respect. And I didn't tell my family, I didn't tell anybody till I told them. Six months ago, that was it. But I had suffered badly through it all. With the help of her family, Christina was finally reunited with her son. She died in February 1997. In 1996, the last of the Magdalen institutions closed. It is still not known exactly how many penitents worked and prayed behind their walls. The church has kept the record secret. But it's estimated that as many as 30,000 women passed through the asylums during this century. Of the many legacies of the Magdalen experience, one that clearly remains is a lasting hostility to the church. I didn't see anything godly in that church. I didn't see anything Christly. All I saw was a bunch of bullies. That was all I... A bunch of bullies and devils dressed up in nuns' habits. That's the way I looked on her. I feel nothing about the Catholic Church. The day I left the Catholic Church, I left that with them. Nuns weren't supposed to be cruel. They were sisters of mercy. They didn't show us any mercy. They weren't supposed to do what they'd done. So I always said if there was a just God in heaven, we wouldn't have suffered like that. That was how I put it when I came out. I don't go to church. I don't pray. I don't force religion down my children's throats. I never have done. 